fishermen, fishermen of the maritime. Their life is not an easy one. It is governed by the sea. 40,000 fishermen and part-time fishermen, one-sixth of the population, live in villages scattered along the 8,000-mile coastline. The sea is their livelihood. Sons have followed their fathers to the sea for generations, inheriting their boats and gear and their skill. These people are direct descendants of the early Acadian French, of the 18th century English settlers under Cornwallis, of the Scotch and Irish political and religious refugees. The fishing grounds are rich and swarming with fish in great variety. Cod, lobster, herrings, and sardines top the list in dollar value. Haddock, mackerel, and hake bring in some five or six million dollars a year between them. 250 million pounds of cod in 1948, eight million dollars. Atlantic salmon, two and a half million pounds, six hundred thousand dollars. More than 50 million pounds of haddock, landed value of nearly two and a half million dollars. For generations, a large number of these people of the Maritimes have combined their fishing with work in the lumber camps and small farming on the side. But in spite of the extra activities, in the past it was a meager living for the fisherman. Fishing is his life, and the run of fish decides his pattern of living. After the plentiful fishing months of summer come the lean months of winter. The maritime provinces, bigger than England, have a population of one and a quarter million people. Here on a small scale are all the vocational problems of a modern nation, from the simpler farm routines to the complexities of heavy industry. Here is the story of how the fishermen joined together to help reconstruct their lives. Hardship and depression have often touched the lives of the people of the Maritimes. But there is the rich Annapolis Valley, the potato crop, the mixed farming of Prince Edward Island, the fertile plains and valleys of New Brunswick. Here the land is rich enough to support a prosperous farming population. There is shipbuilding in the Maritimes, lumbering, pulp and paper mills shipping out of the great seaports of Halifax and St. John. In eastern Nova Scotia, industry is centered around Sydney. The discovery of coal brought capital and steel making to Sydney. It also brought hundreds of British miners in the late 1840s, the hungry 40s in England. They brought with them the cooperative principles of Rochdale. These miners, their descendants, find that the principles of their forefathers are as practical now as they were 100 years ago. Open membership, democratic control, one member, one vote, and the return of surplus earnings to members on the basis of purchases. The miners, and later the steel workers of Sydney, join together in building consumer cooperatives. Men were leaving the fishing industry in the 1920s, coming to the mines and steelworks. Charlie Joe Gallant was one. He will tell you that his dollar goes further in the cooperative store. He knows what he's talking about when he sits on the board of the Cape Breton Cooperative Services, the wholesale organization covering Cape Breton Island. He talks with authority and understanding of the problems of the people who elected him. Seated together at this board of directors meeting are a farmer, 
Charlie Joe, himself a miner, a steel worker, and a fisherman. More than a million dollars worth of consumer goods go out every year from the warehouses of this cooperative wholesale in Sydney to points throughout Cape Breton Island. Pioneer of the local cooperatives is the British Canadian with a proud record of having returned several million dollars in rebates to its members since its formation. And cooperative housing. The Nova Scotia Housing Commission, by means of long-term loans to the cooperatives, made these well-equipped modern houses possible at prices within the reach of the average urban worker. But money alone was not enough. In the study clubs, the cooperators drew up their own complete building plan. It was no easy task to make people aware that study was necessary, not just for the scholar, but for, let's say, the fishermen in this study group. They know what it's all about. You see, they learn the hard way. Take Willie LeBlanc here. Yes, it wasn't always like this. I remember back in the 1920s. I was working for myself then. It wasn't an easy living, but I used to say to myself, so long as there is fish in the sea for me to catch, I can sell it. I was my own boss. had fish to eat. Nearly always dried cod for sure, but it was good eating. In the summer we had fresh fish, but mostly the dry stuff. My children were too young for school yet. The others had lunch at school, about the same time as I had mine at home. There were only three out of the whole village who had the books or boots for going to school that year. My cousin's boy had bread and molasses. The others, they just had bread. Most of the people in the village were going around half-starved, even if they wouldn't admit it. But they were able to talk, Look, and that's the what they did. The fish gone down again today. Talk, Every talk, day talk. That Pete like was yelling at them. You work your silly heads off. And for what? I'm you we're gonna Who takes all the risks in his job? Hard. You, you day. bunch of sheep. Right, you dough heads. You do all the work, but who gets the money? You say that fat man with the necktie buys your fish? Okay, but how much money is in your pocket? Who has two nickels to rub together? Tell me that. They said that fishing was finished. Nobody will pay for fish anymore. We might as well leave it in the water. He said we should all go off to the mines or to the States where you make big money. 
Yeah. It was no use just hanging around here, starving to death. The Maritimes are finished. That's what Pete said, but it all sounded like talk to me. Just the usual talk. I could sell my fish. Good cod, fresh out of the water. But a dollar fifty-nine. I could not believe it. A dollar fifty-nine cents for two hundred and fourteen pounds of fish. That's less than a cent a pound. Ah, but that's the price we're paying. It would not pay for the gas, for the boat. But it was no use arguing. He just said, that is the price we pay. I can't help it. Could they go fishing? What's the use when all you get is less than a cent a pound? What was going to happen to us all? Many of the young folks had already left the village. What about the rest of us? And the children, they just hung around all day. They could not go to school. They had no shoes or school books. Willie, they said, we are getting sick of playing all the time. We want to go back to school. What could they do? This could not go on. But what else is there? Fishing stopped. And our village looked like a graveyard. People just sat around doing nothing at all. All you ever heard was the darn seagulls. Time went by, life went on, somehow. More and more people migrated to other parts of Canada and the United States. Many just went hunting. Then came Dr. J.J. Tompkins to set the heather on fire, as Nova Scotians say. Don't despair, he told the fishermen. Try to do something for yourself. Of the government, he demanded, do something about the desperate plight of the fishermen, but do it quickly. A royal commission was appointed in 1927, the McLean Commission. The commission recommended that the establishment of cooperative organizations of fishermen be assisted by the department as soon as possible, and that an organizer experienced in cooperative methods 
be appointed and paid by the federal government. The man for the job was Dr. M. M. Cody of Antigonish. He said to the men on the beaches, I've come to organize you. Life is possible for all the people. But first, you've got to stop talking about maritime rights until you've turned the searchlight on yourselves and seen where you've fallen down on the job. There are two ways to convert the natural resources of the earth into human use. One is through individual effort. We have to make smart, energetic human individuals. But we're not going to stop there. We've got to resort to the other great possibility, group action, or what we call economic cooperation. It's easy to do. You have the human stuff in you that'll do it. I want to say to you that you're poor enough to want it and smart enough to do it. At the University of St. Francis Xavier in Antigonish, Dr. Cody was made head of the new extension department, founded in order to bring the university to the people. He and his associates evolved a way of training field organizers. He briefed and advised them and sent them out to the people in the study clubs. So they went to the villages carrying the Cody principle that a double-barreled program of adult education and economic cooperation lets the common people in on the worthwhile things of life. And that is how it started for me. I went just to hear what the man had to say. He told us what was going on in other places in the Maritimes, where people had got together like this to learn how to work together. He talked and everybody listened. One of the fellows, an English Protestant, Stan Jenkins, was sitting beside Mike Driscoll, and I remember that Dr. Tompkins once said, there is no Catholic or Protestant way of catching fish. We are all in the same boat. I saw Pete look at me and was thinking, so, you want to be your own boss? Okay, boy. Now you can be the boss. You and everybody else who can work. The first thing we needed was a new lobster factory. After a few nights in the study club, we had our plans worked out. One Monday morning, Pete said, Why can't we go and start now? We haven't got much money, but we can go to the woods and chop some trees and build one. We have the carpenters. We've got some tools. There was no time to waste. The lobster season would soon be here. Let's see if we still know how to work. did know how to work, and it felt good to be at it again. Some of the logs had been sawn at the mill, but we did most of the work ourselves. This was going to be our own plant, so everybody pitched in. The women, too, they did their share. They knitted socks and mitts and made hook rugs to be sold outside to help raise money for the canning machinery. So 
somebody remembered that old boiler lying out in the sand. We went out and got it and hauled it up to the plant. It worked fine when the time came to get up steam. Things moved fast in the years after that first beginning. The boats were checked over. They needed repairs. Money for the purpose could be borrowed from the local credit union, established under the guidance of the extension department and built up with the fishermen's savings over a period of years. The men went back to work. They were in business for themselves now. Things were moving at last. Cooperative canning factories went into full production. With greater security guaranteed, the fishermen began to study better methods of handling and processing the fish. No longer was it left to rot on the wharves. Now it was packed and exported in quantity from the cooperative warehouse. Common ownership of the canning plant and a common responsibility for its success meant a unified and concerted drive. The fisherman, now a member of his own marketing agency, sells his product direct to the world market. It was a big day for Michael Driscoll, manager of the Fisherman's Cooperative, when the first load took off. The rising tide of cooperation has reached up to include not only the means of production, but the means of distribution and selling as well. On our own truck too. The United Maritime Fishermen, the cooperative that developed out of Dr. Cody's early Fisherman's Union, sells the product of these communities. When the distribution centers were established at Chatham and Halifax, the fishermen looked back on their modest beginnings. There was something to celebrate now. Often, the upper part of a cooperative store became a community center. Community life began to expand. But the fisherman's achievement is only part of the story. The Antigonish plan calls for the spread of cooperative methods over the whole countryside, linking the miners and steel workers of the towns in a cooperative brotherhood with the farmers and fishermen in the villages. People are beginning to see the value of cooperation. Not only seeing it, they are living it. Hello there, it's a fine day. Hello there, Johnny. How's Mary? Oh, Mary's all right. Electricity comes into the home and replaces the oil lamp. Luxury or easy living? Not exactly, but the standard of living has been raised where the cooperatives have touched the lives of the people. Now they look to this movement to show the way to the good and abundant life. These consumer-owned stores in village after village are bringing with them a new kind of life. At the consumer co-op, goods are sold at current local prices, neither higher nor lower than private competitors. 
The saving comes at the end of the year when expenses have been deducted. Then a refund is made to members on the basis of purchases made. When the refund comes, the member will often reinvest it to make the business grow. There are two kinds of cooperative enterprise, consumer and producer, and through them a new pattern is being created in the Maritimes. At Scottsburn, it's the creamery. At Lamech, the collecting, refrigerating and shipping of fish. At Edmonston, the regional wholesale. At Fredericton, creamery and poultry, feed and farm machinery. There are these and many others. In Annapolis Valley, apples are the thing. The United Fruit Companies, owned by the apple growers of the valley, operate their processing and cold storage plants at Cold Brook and at Middleton and Hillerton. The new pattern is seen in more and more towns and rural communities. People have found a new sense of purpose where they own the machinery to produce and to distribute their product. At Moncton, here is the master wholesale, Maritime Cooperative Services, located at the railroad center of the provinces. Regional wholesales have been established at Antigonish, at Edmonston, and at Sydney. Here in the Maritimes is a world in miniature, big enough to be meaningful and small enough to be manageable. Now from the Maritimes, the name of this kind of cooperation is reaching out to many parts of the world. In the United States, cooperative societies have been influenced by this example. The same is true in Jamaica, Trinidad, and Puerto Rico. From Scotland and from China, Students have come to see these methods at first hand. But, says Dr. Cody, we have only begun putting into practice the philosophy which we preach. When these initial stages of economic development are passed, the people, caught up by a great vision of future possibilities, will go on to explore for themselves their rich heritage in the great fields of life. Say, I did not know we were all that good. <laughs>